and we are live. Welcome to This Week in Mining, where we discuss how to make money in the junior mining sector. My name is Jay Martin, and I'm your host, and I'm super excited about today's show because I have two great friends who are going to join me very shortly, two individuals who I've learned a ton from during my career as a junior mining investor and as my career as an entrepreneur, to be honest with you. We're going to get into that. Uh, I'll share some stories about what I've learned from these two individuals. These two individuals are the infamous Rick Rule um, and the legendary Ross Beatty, two people who have made piles of money in the junior mining business, and they made their money in very different ways, one as a company builder and one as an investor. Now, if you're familiar with this industry, if you've been around a while, you know who these two gentlemen are. And if you're not, if you're new, welcome. And if you're new to this show, I just want to say a few things about what This Week in Mining is all about. I'm a junior mining investor. I've been a junior mining investor for about 15 years. And I've learned a lot. I've had some amazing years in this business and had some years that were much tougher, right? Where I didn't make uh, as much money as the good years, right? Now, market cycles aside, because obviously the biggest determinant in portfolio performance in such a volatile and cyclical industry is the market cycle, right? Are you fighting a headwind or being blessed by a tailwind? And typically speaking, investing in the junior mining sector is a long patient game. I am a long-term value investor. I encourage anybody on this call to uh, approach the market similar or approach the junior mining market similar. And all that means is that the majority of my capital allocation happens during a couple of years where everybody hates the business. And the majority of my returns happen in a couple of years where everybody loves the business, right? So that's the long-term game. Now, a couple of things I'll share about my guests. Uh, the first is Ross Beatty, arguably the most successful mining entrepreneur in the world. He has founded 15 companies and all 15 um, delivered a 10x return for his shareholders. So just sit with that for a minute. He founded 15 companies and all 15 ended up delivering 10x returns for his early shareholders. Uh, no one else has done that. I don't know of any other industries where an entrepreneur has accomplished that. He's on his 15th company. He claims it's his last. We'll have to wait and see. It's called Equinox, which is also the name of his first company, right? So I, I think he's bookending the career very nicely. We're going to talk about that today. The second is Rick Rule. And Rick has been in this business 40, 50 years and a core investor in most of Ross's companies. Now, so as I mentioned, Ross's companies have consistently delivered the 10x returns, but Listen to this. So Rick's been an investor in like seven to 10 of Ross's companies. And we'll get into this in a minute. And in each case, he realized, you know, a 7x to 10x return, depending on when he bought and when he sold. Maybe he didn't get in super early or maybe he sold before the high, but regardless, 7x is amazing, right? And, and in every case, he generated that return. But also in every case, before he realized that 7x to 10x return, he realized a 40 to 60% drawdown in share price, meaning that after he bought the shares in Ross's company, he saw a 40 to 60% depreciation in his position. Now, I mentioned this, right? And, and then, right, because he's a long-term value investor, he realized the end benefit, which was a, a massive win. The reason I mention this is because anybody who's watching this who thinks that they're just going to be able to pick winning stocks, right? And uh, identify the bottom of the market. And once they buy, the share price will go up and, and that's what's going to happen. And if that doesn't happen, then they made some massive mistake and something went wrong or they took some bad advice or whatever. Maybe, maybe. But all I want to mention is that if, if this is how the business has gone for the most successful mining entrepreneur in the world and one of the most legendary mining investors that they had to go through those 40 to 60% drawdowns before accomplishing their goal as an investor, then what makes you think you won't have to play that game? Maybe you're smarter than them. I don't know. If you are, let me know what you're buying. I'll subscribe to your newsletter, right? But it's important to consider this because that is the game we're playing. And that's why we are long-term value investors. Now, <clears throat> back in, uh, in 2014, you know, I was running the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference and eight other investment conferences. It was kind of crazy. And uh, we were very exposed to the junior mining sector and the junior mining sector fell off a cliff. And I became a business in trouble, serious trouble, actually. If, if you're a subscriber to my newsletter, 
then you know a lot of the stories from like 2013 to 2016, some of the most terrifying years of my life, trying to keep the lights on uh, within my business. And, you know, crazy stories like having bailiffs in my office, trying to seize assets, CRA, seizing bank accounts, all kinds of messiness, right? A business in trouble, like in every classic way. I had a lot of conversations during those years when I was trying to figure out how to right the ship, right? And how best to approach my turnaround strategy. One of the most pivotal was a conversation with Rick Rule. I actually flew down to San Diego and went to Carlsbad, where his office was at that time, sat in his boardroom for two hours. And he was very generous with his time, as, as Rick is. And, and I just went through everything I was facing. I said, here's all the problems that I'm struggling to solve. Here's all the ideas, I think, where our opportunities are. And here's where I'm at right now, you know, and walk through all of this. And of course, I asked him like 100 questions. But one of the questions that I'll never forget was, I said, Rick, point blank, if you were in my seat right now, facing this situation, what would you do? And he kind of sat back in his chair and he thought about it. And he said, well, look, Jay, I can tell you what I did do when I was trying to build a business and I had nothing going for me in this industry. He said, I identified the most promising up and coming people in this business. And then I made myself indispensable to them. Now, this is 40, 50 years ago, Rick, uh, Rick's been in the game a long time, but so these are individuals like Lucas Lundin, you know, Bob Quartermain, Pierre Lasson, Frank Justra, and at the top of his list was Ross Beatty. And so I took this insight to the bank. I flew back to Vancouver and uh, I walked down the street from my office to another office owned by a gentleman named Marin Katusa. You might be familiar with Marin if you've been in this business for a little bit. And back then, he hadn't launched Katusa Research yet, which is now a very successful research and financing business. Uh, he had just left Casey Research, where he was the chief energy strategist and had an amazing track record and great following of subscribers and all this stuff. But he was just going independent, right? He was launching his own thing. And I knew this would be the moment where he could use some help, right? He had an amazing track record and a crazy brain for identifying opportunities. And I had a platform, right? Financially insolvent as it might have been, I had a platform, right? I had an audience and all this. And so he had something I didn't have, which was way more experience in the junior mining industry. And I had something he didn't have, which was promotion, right? And so we struck a deal and um, essentially a barter agreement just said, I'll do this for me if you'll do this for me, you know? And and I, I said, I'll put your name on the events. I want you to come up and, and own the stage and, and let's lift Katusa Research up, you know, with, with my events. And in exchange, I want access to your Rolodex. I want, I want you to help me land a bunch of clients that aren't picking up my calls. And I want to be in your boardroom once a month for two hours to strategize, right? And that was the trade we made. And we, we did that for like four years. And it was an amazing exchange of human capital. But, you know, look, the point of this is, is that you can find people who fill in your weaknesses, right? I became indispensable to him. He became indispensable to me. Now, when it comes to investing, the exact same principle applies, right? Now, my strength as an investor is people. My strength is people because, you know, today, you know, the VRIC is a great business and we have nine, 10,000 investors that show up every year. It's one of the largest investment conferences in North America. And I host this show every year. I'm in the people business. And I also host the Jay Martin show for the last few years. I've had, you know, two, three guests on that show every week, money managers who have been around the block have a lot of scar tissue and a lot of wins and I can learn from them. But as a consequence, I know people, right? And my ability to do diligence on people is better than most because I go through a high volume of people every single year and uh, I stick to the winners, right? But I've got my blind spots. Like I'm not a geologist, right? And so, you know, a guy like Brent Cook, for example, uh, exploration geologist is going to look at the same company as me and see it totally differently. And so, that's the purpose of this show. Okay, this is the, the purpose. Let me put a bookend on this story here. That's the purpose of this show. We are better in a community because we can find people who fill in our weaknesses. Last week on the show, I had Jamie Keach join as one of my guests. I had Jamie Keach join because if, I, if my competitive advantage as an investor is people, Jamie's a mining engineer. He's also a very successful investor, but he sees things differently than I do. And we can both look at the same investment opportunity and we're going to see completely different weaknesses and completely different strengths. I'm going to learn from what he sees and he's going to learn from what I see. And in this scenario, one plus one absolutely equals three. That is the purpose of this show. Building a junior mining investment portfolio is very hard. 
It's a tough business and you can lose your shirt. Now you can absolutely do it alone. You can exhaustively research at your desk, read the letters, listen to the podcast, do the diligence. And that's far better than not doing that work. At least start there. But we're better in a community because we can lean on the brain capital of our peers. My mission with This Week in Mining is to bring brain capital to this show so that you can borrow it. That's why it's a live show. To be honest, a live show is a total headache. I'd much rather record and, and distribute like we do with the majority of our content. But because it's live, we have a live chat. You can engage. You can ask me questions. You can ask my guests questions. I'll do my best to answer as many as I can and, and pay attention to what's in there, all right? Because it's a tough business and we're stronger if we lean on our community. So that's what this show is all about. We're here every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Pacific time, 5 p.m. Eastern time, this week in mining. Let's ride this market together, right? And become better as a consequence. Okay, I'm going to go get my guests. I'm very excited to bring them on. As I mentioned, Rick Rule and Ross Beatty. Uh, I'm going to go make sure they're ready. I will be back in one minute. Stick around. You've noticed a shift in the world of finance. The smartest investors in the world are no longer gambling on overvalued tech stocks. They're investing in the raw materials that power our world. Commodities. Now, I've been a commodity investor for over 15 years and I'm the host of one of the world's largest commodity investment conferences. I teach a 10 chapter course on commodity investing for beginners. No complex strategies, just actionable information. From the fuel on your car to the battery in your phone, commodities are the silent engine of the global economy. It's the raw materials like oil, gold, and uranium that power our lives and could power your portfolio. Our comprehensive course breaks down the complexities so you can make informed decisions and gain financial freedom. My team and I have assembled a 10 chapter course to get you started on building your portfolio as a commodity investor. Everything you need to know to have a competitive advantage and an edge in this market, providing you with the skills to make informed decisions, unlocking investment opportunities most people don't even know exist. Jay Martin, and this is the Commodity University. Get started today. You've noticed a shift in the world of finance. The smartest investors in the world are no longer gambling on overvalued tech stocks. They're investing in the raw materials that power our world. Commodities. Now, I've been a commodity investor for over 15 years, and I'm the host of one of the world's largest commodity investment conferences. I teach a 10 chapter course on commodity investing for beginners. No complex strategies, just actionable information. From the fuel on your car to the battery in your phone, commodities are the silent engine of the global economy. It's the raw materials like oil, gold, and uranium that power our lives and could power your portfolio. Our comprehensive course breaks down the complexities so you can make informed decisions and gain financial freedom. My team and I have assembled a 10 chapter course to get you started on building your portfolio as a commodity investor. Everything you need to know to have a competitive advantage and an edge in this market, providing you with the skills to make informed decisions, unlocking investment opportunities most people don't even know exist. Jay Martin, and this is the Commodity University. Get started today. You've noticed a shift in the world of finance. The smartest investors in the world are no longer gambling on overvalued tech stocks. They're investing in the raw materials that power our world. Commodities. No, I've been a commodity investor for over 15 years, and I'm the host of one of the world's largest commodity investment conferences. I teach a 10 chapter course on commodity investing for beginners. No complex strategies, just actionable information. From the fuel on your car to the battery in your phone, 
Commodities are the silent engine of the global economy. It's the raw materials like oil, gold, and uranium that power our lives and could power your portfolio. And we're back. Thank you for sticking around. I'm joined right now by the infamous Rick Rule and the legendary Ross Beatty. I'm not sure if you two have met before. I'm, I'm really happy to introduce you today on this call. He's uh, infamous. I'm legendary. I think it should be the reverse. I agree, frankly. <laughs> tell, me, tell me why, Rick. <laughs> no, I'm teasing. I, uh, I, I certainly agree with his, uh, with his introduction. Uh, legendary. Knowing Ross has been uh, both profitable and pleasant for me for the 40 years that we've known each other. You know, I, I touched on that a lot in the introduction, and I shared a piece of advice that you gave me, Rick, back in, I think it was 2014, I came to see you in Carlsbad, and I was going through a ton of challenges in my business, and I said, you know, you welcomed me into your boardroom for like two hours, we sat and jammed on some things that I was trying to figure out, and one of the questions that I asked you was, you know, if you were in my shoes right now, what would you do? And you said, look, I can tell you what I did do when I was getting started. You know, I identified the most promising up and comers in the business. And then I made myself indispensable to them. You listed four or five names and, and Ross is at the top. And then you said, and Jay, if I'd only ever invested in those four or five names and only them, I'd have worked half as hard and made 10 times as much money. And, you know, it's, it's very valuable insight. This is a people business and you've lived that. No, I think that's right. If you look at any field of human endeavor, uh, what you'll find is that there are a fairly small proportion of the population that are serial outperformers. People don't like that statement because it's elitist. As unpleasant as it might be, it's true. And you align yourself with that reality to your profit. Uh, you ignore that reality to your detriment. <laughs> I was mm -hmm. merciful enough. I mean, I, I was lucky enough uh, early in my career to be able to identify a reasonable number of, of serial outperformers, one of whom uh, is your other guest today. Uh, and in addition to the fact that had I constrained myself to a smaller number of people, in addition to the fact that I would have made more money uh, and worked less hard, I would have had more fun. Mm. Uh, I remember Ned Goodman telling me uh, at about the same time, about 40 years ago, Rick, you shouldn't ever do real business with somebody that you don't want to have dinner with because you will have a problem at some point in time. And if you two like each other, you can resolve the problem over dinner. If you don't, you're going to resolve it in court. And it's more efficient to resolve problems at dinner than in court. So for many reasons, what you say, Jay, is very true. Ross, I've heard you talk a lot about that from a company builder standpoint. As soon as you identify a relationship that you just don't see as a fit, you're very quick to deal with it. Um, are there any red flags? Like talk, elaborate on that lesson for me a little bit, if you could today. Well, I think just following up with what Rick said, you want to work with nice people. I think that's that's a general principle, and you want to work with people you can you can resolve disputes with easily. Uh, and and there's a lot of nice people around. And there's a lot of not so nice people who are interested in short gains and and uh, or quick gains and 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 bending the rules and that kind of stuff. And and you know the litmus test is is yeah whether you can enjoy a, a meal over you know over over any problem you might have. Um, and um, and have fun with them. I mean, that's really important to me to to build something and have fun while you're doing it. Life's too short to fight people. Life's too short to get into petty arguments. And so you want to deal with people who are of the like mind and and uh, and not people who are litigious, who who solve problems by suing and and fighting. And you know, it, life's too short. Can I ask you a follow up question on the on the people topic, Rick? You know, last week we had a debate on this channel about the most important ingredients uh, when you're looking at a new investment opportunity, specifically in the junior mining business, the most common answer was the CEO and the management team need to be substantial owners of the stock, which makes logical sense. Why would I write a check into a company if the management hasn't already, right? I want to win if they're going to win. I want them to be tied to the performance of the company. Uh, but then we ended up in a bit of a debate where one of my guests brought up the point that sometimes you meet a young entrepreneur who has not made themselves any wealth yet, 
And so they haven't been able to buy a significant amount, amount of their own stock. Now they own a little bit, but not a material amount. Now, outside of that point, they're doing everything right. They're working tirelessly. They're surrounding themselves with an amazing network and building great advisors, but there's that one red flag. Now, have you ever made an exception and, and taken that leap? And if so, how did that work out for you? Uh, I've made that exception a hundred times, <laughs> at least. Uh, and probably 90% of the time, it didn't work out for me. Hmm. Uh, where it did work out for me is where the young entrepreneur came recommended to me by serially successful people who I know well. As an example, Brian Dalton came to me, uh, forming Altius 30 years ago now, pimply-faced young geologist uh, from northern Newfoundland, didn't have two dimes to rub together. Uh, I, I sort of threw him out of my office, but I told him that he ought to go see Hugh Mogensen, who Ross Beatty knows well. Uh, Hugh Mogensen called me back and says, listen, I don't know what you're going to do, but I'm going to write this kid a check. <laughs> well, <laughs> I better revisit my premise. But mostly, uh, although you do miss the young entrepreneur, uh, what happens is if you are not afraid of missing out. Statistically, the best thing to do is go with the proven and probable people. It's best to go with the proven and probable people during bad markets. Mm. Uh, in a very bad market, uh, I can buy Ross Beatty for half of net asset value. <laughs> Why on earth would I want to take the chance on the lame, the halt, and the blind at hat net, hat, half net asset value if I can get Ross Beatty or... or uh, the Lundines or Friedland or Bob Quartermain at half of NAV. But this is just simple arithmetic. I, I get the romance of tagging on to some entrepreneur before he or she has the success premium attached to them. But if you like to invest in bad markets, <laughs> you get to buy the best franchises in the business at half NAV. That's what makes life great. You know, and, and that all makes sense to me. Where I where I find myself struggling with that, Rick, is like, but is that what you did 40 years ago? You know, and how did you get around that when you found Ross and, and Lucas and, you know, Bob Quartermain before they were the Rob, the Ross, the Lucas and the Bob that we know today? Well, early on, you see, I met this guy who helped me. Uh, his name was Joe Martin. You may know <laughs> this guy. Uh, Joe Martin had a publication called BC Business. Uh, and I had a restaurant and a bar <laughs> because I like to read and he liked to eat and drink. We came to know each other. Uh, and among other things uh, in that circle of friends, uh, I, uh, I came to meet uh, uh, a different guy, a friend of Joe Martin's named Peter Brown, uh, who basically ran the Vancouver Stock Exchange. And very early on, Peter Brown uh, introduced me to a guy named Adolf Lundin. Uh, I did my first work for Adolf Lundin. I made myself indispensable to Adolf. Uh, if my memory serves me well, at the ripe old age of 21. So I'm embarrassed to say I started at the top. <laughs> um, really through hard work and networking. What on earth did Adolf Lundin have to gain from a young hustling bar owner? Well, in retrospect, I was interested. Uh, I kept asking the guy questions. And I think what I had that Adolf didn't have was legs. I was willing to do the work. I was willing to apply myself. Uh, I was willing to just absolutely work my ass off to expand his network. It's the only thing that I can think of. But in truth, uh, even at that point in time, whenever I entered into an investment just because I thought it was a trade, not because I deeply believed in the entrepreneur behind the investment, the probability was, the overwhelming probability was that I was going to lose money. And I lost a lot of money violating that principle. <laughs> and, and Ross, when you think about that point in your career, you know, you were the, you know, wet behind the ears. He sure you know, was. <laughs> green entrepreneur soliciting for cash looking for support right and trying to build your first couple of companies 
What, what stands out to you as like a pivotal moment, something that occurred to you, a relationship that you built that changed how you thought about the business, changed how you made decisions and shaped the entrepreneur that you eventually became? Yeah, uh, you know, Jay, I've been thinking about that. And to be perfectly honest, I, I nothing comes to mind. It, it's It was just, for me, it was just <laughs> the school of hard knocks. It was just kind of putting my head down and, you know, doing what I thought was the right thing to do. I had no business experience. I had no... I had no uh, mentor, none at all. My dad had died when I was 21, a long time ago. He was the only guy I really was, you know, sort of had a, a gene of entrepreneurship, I guess, from him and, and a, a great model as a nice guy and a hard worker. But, you know, I, I can honestly say there was nobody there that that helped me, helped me, helped prevent me from making all kinds of really stupid mistakes in my very first company, which was, which was Equinox Resources. And, and, um, and yet I had this sort of drive. I had this, this you know, this real just hard work and, you know, grind it out. And I had no interest and I was a true entrepreneur, I had no interest in working for someone else. I wanted to make my own mistakes. And really, you know, I was very lucky because Rick was with me at the very, very start. Uh, you know, he definitely was, 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 you know, one of the people that I, I, I'm not sure I learned anything from Rick, but I was sure happy he was a shareholder and a, and a, and a kind of a fellow sufferer with me as we did, as I did many, many dumb things in that first company. But, you know, I didn't have, I didn't have two cents to rub together. I, I had, my first uh, business was actually a little geo contracting company, BD Geological, and I, you know, was making pretty good bread and butter. I had a lot of geologists working for me. I dreamed up projects and sold them to mining companies and did a bunch of work and made some bread and butter. But I, I, I put all that money back into buying shares in my first company because I realized that, you know, owning shares in a public company, if you're the CEO and, and you do well, that's the retirement fund. It's not a bread and butter business. It's truly something you can have a retirement fund from. You can really score big and make a big win. And I realized that early on. And I, you know, I was doing a million things, but I just decided, you know what? I'm going to do one thing, focus everything on that one company, buy as many shares as I could in the early days. Um, and, and I did that. And I eventually built up a stock position that when I sold the company nine years later, I did really well and I, I made my first fortune. And with that fortune, I parlayed it into, you know, many, many other ones. But, you know, it's it's just sort of believing in yourself, grinding away, um, you know, like I said, making making more mistakes than, you know, I can believe in hindsight. But we did a couple of good things and we had a good team and, you know, it was it was uh, eventually a success. I, I relied on luck as much as anything and and, and luck eventually delivered. So um, that was that was kind of how that went. Ross, might you consider substituting uh, the phrases perseverance and tenacity hmm. for luck? Uh, other people experience one difficulty and they fold. You yeah. mentioned that your first success, despite your mistakes, took you nine years from start to finish. So I would suggest humbly <laughs> or not so humbly that you consider substituting the phrase perseverance and tenacity for luck. Well, maybe. I mean, you you would know, Rick. You were a, you were a shareholder and a, an observer and a friend of mine all through those years. So <laughs> you know how many mistakes we made, but eventually we got. Yeah, we eventually we we found a gold mine, found a gold mine, proverbial found a gold mine, and then made 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 it work. You know, I think you actually gave the best possible answer to that question, Ross. And and the key word was eventually, right? Yeah. Uh, it was just you, you showed up every day. But isn't that the, the point, though, right? And at Actually, at the last conference we hosted in January in Vancouver, one of the key themes that we talked about on stage was time horizon. And, you know, actually, when I introed you to today, I talked about how, Rick, you shared stories about, I think you've been an investor in maybe seven to 10 of Ross's deals. And at each time, you know, realized that that 10 bagger result. But before you did that, you know, you went to some pretty dramatic market turmoil and saw a share price depreciation of maybe 40%, right? Share price depreciation. Good line. Well, that's that's absolutely true. In fact, I've been involved, if you include spin outs, in 14 of Ross's deals now. Yeah. Uh, and I'm delighted to say that something like 11 of them have been for me 10 baggers. Uh, thank you, Ross. Uh, looking back, the average 10 bagger took between five and seven years. <laughs> and I don't think that any of your stocks, Ross, that I've been involved in, haven't given me a 50% share price depreciation <laughs> on my way to a 10 bagger. So just as Ross has to be persistent and tenacious, uh, 
the person who is investing uh, alongside him uh, has to do the same thing. You have to have, uh, I, I think that speculators pay too much attention to share price. And I think that that information, the price information is useless if you don't have an idea about value. Uh, the fact that a stock goes from, you know, a dollar to a dollar 25 might be pleasant, but that statistic has no meaning if you don't have a feeling for what the value is. It's the delta between the price and the value or the delta between the price and its expected value, which is where 10 baggers come from. Mm. And you that can, is, and you that can is, trade to buy dinner at the highs or force no tires or something like that. Uh, you can trade based on price, but you can only make a fortune based on value. The only thing I'd add to that, Rick, is, um, is because this industry we are in is by its nature a cyclical industry. It, it has the sine curve of booms and busts. Right. And so the value concept cannot be frozen in time. The value Agreed. changes fundamentally every single second that world market prices change. We are living in a world where nobody really has real control over the gold price or the silver price or the copper price. And so it changes all the time. But we know that the world is a cyclical world. The world is an eco has economic cycles, has political cycles, has, for some reason, maybe has human cycles. But certainly the, 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 the public company market and commodity plays uh, or money plays, which is what gold and silver are, uh, really is a cyclical business. So what you want to do at a certain time is establish value at that moment. Is it, is it going to stay that value? Is there a discount to that value price at a, at a particular time in at a particular moment in time? Uh, and is that going to change down or up based on how you see the future? And, and so I've always, you know, my biggest gains have been times when I've been able to set a company up in a, in a say, a bear market uh, founded on the notion that we're going to have higher prices and build an asset base that is cheap at one set of economic conditions, but is going to be expensive and valuable at another. And, and that's worked for me in silver and nickel and copper and, and gold now uh, really quite well. So I, I, I always, you know, I always think of the value notion and, and the market has these bizarre times. Actually, we're, we're in one right now when the market just doesn't value gold companies in a rational way. Uh, people have been selling gold companies for the last three years, while at the same time, the gold price has gone up. So it's a very particular, peculiar time right now. This is a disconnect time. And I'm, I'm banging the drum that it's an absolutely wonderful time for people to be buying precious metals companies just because this delta exists uh, for other peculiar reasons, but it's not likely to last. It, it certainly is historically unprecedented. Therefore, it's not likely to last. And, mm -hmm. and that makes for a great, as, as Rick said, a great, a great opportunity because the value is there, but the market is not pricing it in. If you back the right entrepreneur, the malaise in the price of gold shares is the fault of the gold industry because there's been so many failures. You need to leaven what you just said, Ross. If you invest in the sector, over time you will go broke because the sector contains so much flotsam and jetsam. If you back the right companies, <laughs> if you back people that generate value as opposed merely to optionality in gold, you'll do extraordinarily well. But I would urge people listening to this discussion to not believe that even because there is a disconnect between the price of gold shares and the price of gold, that one can invest in the gold mining sector with impunity. Uh, let's 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 pick on an entrepreneur we know, uh, Ross Beatty. <laughs> uh, let's talk about a company called Equinox. Let's look at the task at hand, taking uh, a few small mines, uh, using the constituency to buy bigger mines, lavishing love, care, and attention on assets that other people couldn't make work and making them work. Let's look at a share price that declined along with the whole sector because the industry didn't believe that a team as uh, assembled by Ross Beatty could build a billion dollar project in Northern Ontario without coming in a year behind schedule or double budget. 
if you believed differently with regard to the Ross Beattie team, that 50% share price decline for you wouldn't have been unnerving. It would have been attractive. Had you bet on the industry as a whole in Northern Ontario in the last four years in terms of building mines, you would have lost approximately 80% of your money. Uh, if, however, uh, Ross Beattie was able to, his team, pardon me, was able to deliver a mine on time, on budget, and eliminate all the risks, someone would have to begin to look at a shrinking delta between price and value. Now, too, if that company was able in six months to turn that mine at nameplate capacity, <laughs> you follow where I'm going? I, I object to your description of the delta between the price of mining shares in general and gold in general, because I think the outcome is very much company specific. Rick, I want to I want to dig a bit deeper uh, tactically with you right now. One of the biggest trends on channels like mine is is geopolitical risk right now. It's become a right. louder conversation over the last few years, and maybe in terms of of cycles, you could say it's it's a it's not a favorable time to be investing outside of safe jurisdictions. The big unknown variable there is what does safe jurisdiction mean? You know, I know you've made a ton of your money investing in jurisdictions that people may think they should stay away from, right? And you look at a continent like Africa right now, there's been nine military coups overthrowing governments in the last three years. And you could say, why would I want to invest any cash there? I think you've made a lot of money investing in Africa. So how do you process geopolitical risk? And what would you share with the audience today on that topic? I think all jurisdictions are risky. Uh, I will agree that some jurisdictions which have uh, <laughs> less advanced precedent with regards to the rule of law uh, are probably more risky. But I would suggest to you that I would rather take political risk personally than project or technical risk. The biggest absolute losses of net present value that I have experienced personally due to political risk happened in the People's Republic of California, Viceroy's Resources, ultimately now controlled by Ross Beatty. <laughs> uh, that discovery was seven miles, unfortunately, on the wrong side of the California-Nevada line. And we experienced a 13-year delay between discovery and production. Think about the net present value of cash flow. Uh, delayed for 13 years at, say, a 6% discount. Beyond that, of course, there were the $16 million in bribes that we had to pay. Not efficient bribes like in Africa, but things like campaign contributions and deeds in lieu. So when somebody describes political risk, the first political risk that comes to my mind is the People's Republic of California. Then, of course, I was a non-resident owner, investor, in a different risky jurisdiction. That was called Vancouver. British Columbia, where the city council and the provincial government decided in their wisdom that uh, they should uh, apply new taxes on my residents equal to 9% of the assessed value of the resident per year. A and yet people tell me that Canada's not a risky jurisdiction. Uh, is, con is confiscation on the installment plan not risk? Um, listen, I've I, I've had bad experience in lots of countries. I was dumb enough to invest a quarter million dollars in Afghanistan, lost it all. Mm -hmm. But my losses in Afghanistan, both in terms of the quantum of the money I lost and the time it took me to lose it, relative to my losses in California, were de minimis. Mm -hmm. I, I know. I mean, Ross has had Ross has done business everywhere. He's had challenges in. Peru, he's had challenges in Mexico, he's had challenges in Chile, God knows he's had challenges in Africa, he'll probably never go back. But I suspect he's had challenges in California, which right now, being in front of California regulators, he's probably too polite to discuss. The truth is that political risk is where you face it. I like that. And, and Ross, I wanted to ask you, what would you bolt on to that? Anything that you would oh. share? I mean, I could go on for hours about political risk. I've worked in the, the craziest places in the world, in Haiti, scared away by a military coup, in West Africa, scared away by a revolution. 
in Russia beaten up by Putin's cronies and had most of the stuff I was working on stolen. And after three years of hard work, I just could go on and on. But, you know, we've invested, made a fortune in Peru. It was one of the worst places in the world five years before I got involved there. And it turned out to be one of the best. So you can't be too picky with uh, geopolitical risk. I think you've got to just hold your nose. And and my strategy has been to diversify your assets, to, you know, have a have a, a bunch of assets in a bunch of different pots. So you don't have all your all your eggs in one basket. That's that's worked for me. Right now, Ross, are there what, what are the jurisdictions that you think are are more favorable? Are there any that catch your eye? Canada looks pretty good. <laughs> Canada, Australia, you know, so. I mean, there, there's some there's some good places and there's an awful lot of bad places right now. But you know, it's weird. The world works. You know, I've been in this game a long time, like Rick, and the, it's almost like the there's something in the air because because you get these weird, just global things. More populism happens, and then and then people realize that populism does not create wealth; it actually destroys wealth. And and all of a sudden, people go into sort of more more uh, more favorable regimes, and people aren't just trying to steal everything that that, that entrepreneurs are trying to create. And it's it's not just one place. It, it, the whole world sort of goes in these cycles. And and uh, and if like in the '90s was a very good time to be invested in 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 in, in strange countries. Um, they were by and large well behaved. And then uh, in the last few years, it's been the exact opposite. There, there's been a lot of places like Panama and all kinds. Of, I could reel them off for for for, for ages here. The, the the bad countries to be in right now. Um, and there's just a whole bunch more than there were. So that makes today countries like Canada look pretty good. But tomorrow could be a whole whole different uh, different situation. The worst places to, today could be the best places tomorrow. So you can't be too clever on this stuff. Mm. Appreciate that. Rick, where are you allocating capital right now? What stage of the market are you looking at producers, developers, explorers? You've got a fairly high risk tolerance relative to most investors I know, and you tend to be early and first. Um, where are you looking right now for opportunity? Well, for the last eight years, uh, I haven't seen deal terms among the juniors that tempted me as much as the bigger companies. Uh, private placements, as an example, didn't include warrants, although they always seem to include options. Uh, so I found myself in bigger companies. Uh, I find myself now gravitating towards the smaller companies. Uh, I tend to love hate. Uh, one of the things I always really liked about Ross was him telling me uh, at 90 cent copper, that the incentive price for copper was a buck fifty or a buck sixty, uh, and we needed to buy copper deposits that didn't work at ninety cents but would work at a buck fifty or a buck sixty, because we could buy copper deposits that a major had spent a hundred million dollars on. We could buy them for three million dollars because they had no net present value, but they would. Right. And so right. that's the sort of theme that interests me. Uh, I grew up in resources in the oil and gas business, around a business model called prospect generation. And the guy who attracted me to it in the mining business was a guy who couldn't raise any money in mining markets named Ross Beattie. Hmm. Uh, and he started a prospect generator called Equinox that went through a hundred and something projects with other people's money. All those mistakes he made, <laughs> big companies funded. He didn't. I didn't. It was wonderful. Hmm. So uh, I'm interested in the exploration business because everybody hates it. I'm interested in prospect generation because from an equity investor's point of view, it's the most efficient form of exploration finance. Uh, and so that's where I'm going. I'm going way, way, way down market because the rest of the market has returned to investors' favor. And besides which, I'm already full. <laughs> you know, I've been, I've been buying this stuff like a madman for the last four years. Uh, I, I love hate. And there has been so much hate on the horizon that I got full to overflowing uh, with the big high quality names. Uh, and so I'm coming down market now. I, I want to double click on something you said right at the beginning of that, Rick. And I just don't want to take it for granted because we have a lot of new subscribers that that come in and maybe aren't familiar with some of the terms you use, but you said you're seeing a lot of financings that don't include a warrant. However, the company is still offering options. If you could expand on why that's significant and, and what exactly that means, I think that'd be valuable. Sure. I want you to watch, watch Ross's face very closely when I do this. You mentioned five-year warrants, right? Ish, <laughs> issuers regard warrants as dilution. The difference between an option and a warrant is who gets it. So the issuer regards uh, any upside in a financing that they don't get as dilution. 
uh, I notice that even when warrants are on our offer, the company tends, tends to want to do two-year warrants, while the options that they issue themselves are five-year options. If the market falls apart, it seems that the options get replaced to reflect market conditions, while the warrants don't. A good entrepreneur like Ross Beattie will say to me, I love picking on Ross, a good entrepreneur will say to me, but Rick, that's an unfair comparison. I work at the company. I'm creating value. To which I say, Ross, that's right. You work there five days a week, but my money works there seven days a week. So by rights, if there's 12 shares, I should get seven and you should get five. I, I hope that helps clear things up, Jay. Well, in truth, since she's using my name, uh, in in, uh, in with some uh, certain slander attached to it, I wouldn't I wouldn't hear that. I mean, I don't. First of all, I don't issue options anymore. I mean, they I they were they were once issued, but quite frankly, they were expensive. They're not very useful, and uh, in most companies, they're not uh, particularly good forms of compensation. So they're stupid, and they're costly to every company. Mm -hmm. uh, they're extra dilution you don't need and you shouldn't have, and so are five year warrants and two year warrants and all warrants for that matter. They are dilution you don't need and you shouldn't want. If you need money, go into a financing. Uh, yes, they're an incentive to risky risk investors like Rick uh, to make risky investments. But you know, if the stock is 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 priced right, if the if the business plan is good enough, you shouldn't need warrants. And uh, and so I've never been a great fan of of uh, of attaching warrants to any financings, and I haven't done so for many many years. Um, but uh, but by the same token, options are inefficient as well. So I say out with them all. Okay. Yeah. Good, good perspective. And one other question I'll hit you with Ross to see if you differ from Rick on this point. So I know Rick, I've heard you recently and most of the, most of the times we spoke actually described the junior market as overfunded, regardless of how scarce the entrepreneurs and investors may feel capital is you consistently come out and say, no, this market's overfunded right now. And mainly always, uh, Ross, what, what's your take on, on that thought? No, I think, yeah, I think Rick's right in that. I mean, what he means is uh, there's a lot of money chasing, you know, a lot of companies and only a few of those companies are ever going to work well, either because of management or projects or or luck or whatever. And and so he's right. But but you've got to remember, too, this is a very speculative industry, much like a casino. It is a form of casino, except you rarely lose all your money if you're an investor. And sometimes you do have a 10-bagger or 20-bagger, and you can have that again and again if you back the right companies in any market, good markets and bad markets. So, you know, that's kind of why there's there's always money there, because there's always there's always gamblers, and, and gamblers like taking these speculative bets, particularly if if those if those gamblers have a view on let's say gold, or let's say anything, uranium, rare earth metals, anything. If people can have these views on things and you never buy a commodity investment uh, or a commodity-based company, you'd never buy it if you think the metal price is going to stay where it is. You always assume it's going to go up. No gold investor buys a gold stock unless that gold investor thinks the gold price is going to go up. You'd never buy a gold stock if you think the gold, stock, gold price is going to go down. So it's kind of it's just like to me it's just part of the part of the game. You're and it's never going to change. And yes, we can complain that there's there's way too much money in the in the in the in the industry and there's way too much serial issuance of of stock uh, that that causes this this sort of flood of 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 liquidity that that is often meets illiquidity. So you get the, you get this 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 terrible you know these bear cycles that happen and they're just brutal. There's no liquidity in any of these names. And there's too many names and there's too many promoters and, and all that stuff. I think that's what Rick's complaining about. I just think it's the nature of the business. And I don't think I don't think it's uh, it's going to end. And I don't think it maybe it shouldn't end. I don't know. It's part of the game. Yeah, I mean, my my only take on that would be, is there another way, Rick? Like, what, what do you think? Is there until we have better technology and a more efficient way of determining what's far beneath the surface? You know, is is there a, a different way that we can at People. scale? People. Okay. People. I mean, yeah. there's 3,000 juniors around the world. 85% uh, 80, of them are run by the lame, the halt, and the blind. Uh, you find people who failed in crypto, and then they failed in pot. Now they're failing in AI. Uh, and if gold goes to 3,000 bucks, all these AI uh, promoters are going to go into gold, although they can't spell gold. This is really simple stuff, Jay. There are people who are serially successful. There are people who build management teams whose skill sets are suited to the task at hand. 
So then Ross in, in that right. case, Rice, Ross is right when he describes the average speculator as a punter. That's why the average speculator loses. They run to a slot machine where the boat, where the where the light is flashing, despite the fact that the probability of it flashing again is very, very, very low. Unlike a casino in junior mining, if you work hard, you can impact the odds. Right. right. You can uh, you can align yourself with a deposit that has the potential to be a, a tier one deposit, not a you know, not a sort of a penny dreadful. You can allow yourself to hang out with people who've been successful 10 times in the past, or you can pick a serial loser who's a good storyteller. Mm. You can look at a company's uh, income statement uh, and balance sheet and see a company where general and administrative expense over the last five years has been below 20% of capital raised, or you can buy the TSXV where the median is closer to 50% a year. This is not tough stuff, but you have to do it. It's actually a great way to close the loop because it comes back to what we opened the conversation with, that the sector is overfunded. It's nobody's fault, but the investors who are overfunding yeah. entrepreneurs yeah. who don't deserve capital and yeah. not focusing on the entrepreneurs you know, success begets success who have the resume, surround themselves with other winners, even if they're the up and comer, they've got the veteran on the board. That's typically what I look for. If it's the younger, less experienced entrepreneur, you want to see the support on the board of a Ross Beatty or of a Frank Juster or someone like this. Um, I know you got to wrap it up here, Ross. So I want to leave it the final word with you. Um, I'm a shareholder of Equinox. I think it's a great place for investors to begin if they're just beginning building a resource portfolio because you're a fantastic steward of shareholder capital. And so their their cash is in good hands. Walk my audience through what you're building with Equinox and why. Well, I mean, you know, it's 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 building a mining company. It's not a not a trivial thing. It's it's also not terribly complex in in the basic principles. You try to work with good people, have adequate capital, and then you have a mission. You have a plan and a mission. Our mission is to be a a leading gold mining company on the world stage uh, quickly. And so Equinox started six years ago. It's it's now got seven operating mines. We're one month away from starting our eighth. And uh, and we're trying to become a 1 million ounce gold producer and we'll get there in the next couple of years, I think, uh, quite quite soundly and probably you know much, much higher. So that'll that'll make the company a big, a big gold plan. The reason we're going big is because I'm very bullish on the gold price. Uh, so the bigger a gold producer you have, the, the uh, and the bigger your gold reserves and resources, the more you're going to have value uh, in a in a rising gold market. So you know we've certainly been right on on the gold price. We started this company when gold was thirteen fifty, and it's now twenty three fifty, uh, and uh, we built a, a a big company. We've got a you know three or four billion dollar market cap and. 8,000 employees and, and seven operating mines now, and, and, uh, and it's off to the races. But, you know, not every day there's a, there's a new challenge. Every, <laughs> it's not an easy business. There's a lot of risks out there in, in every which way and, and every country. We're in four countries now, Brazil, Mexico, the U.S., and, and Canada. And uh, so it it's definitely has its challenges. But, uh, you know, you want to make, make more good bets than, than, than wrong ones or good decisions than wrong ones over over time and and so far so good you know we we've had a pretty good run this year we're the second best producing gold company in the in the market uh that's because we're highly leveraged we're highly leveraged because we're quite a high cost gold producer but our costs will be almost halved when this new big canadian mine opens up in in a month it's uh, it's going to you know it's our, our average cost right now are around 14 or 1500 dollars an ounce and this this mine will produce 400,000 ounces a year for about 900 dollars an ounce all in sustaining costs so you know that's that's where we're going, and it's it's been a it's been it's been a bit of an up and down exercise. But uh, 2022 was a terrible year. 2023 was a pretty good year. 2024 looks like it's going to be a fabulous year. So mm -hmm. um, that's the way it is. It's 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 usually fun, and that was what uh, I wanted to 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 do the whole time. You know, we're we're working on this. If you can't have fun, you shouldn't be doing what you're doing. You should be doing something else. Uh, and uh, a lot of our shareholders are your, I think your, uh, your friends and 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 and, uh, and and supporters as well. Jay, certainly Rick, it's been a, a great one over the years. And uh, and to all those people, I I certainly extend my thanks for joining us on this journey. I'm seeing a lot of support actually uh, for Equinox in the live chat. A lot of people seem to be shareholders, Ross, which is awesome to see. 
Um, I want to thank you both for joining me on the show today and getting in front of this new audience and everybody who showed up today uh, in the audience and in the chat. Thank you for tuning in. We are here every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Pacific and 5 p.m. Eastern time. I'll be bringing new brain capital for us to learn from every single week. I want to ride this market together. Let's do this as a community. It's a tough business. It's easier with a good network. And that's what we're doing here on This Week in Mining. Next week, I'll be joined by Andy Sheckman and probably a couple more. Wednesday, 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern. I will see you next week. Thank you.